episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show with another really fascinating guest for you today, helping to create uh, a better tomorrow on, on many different fronts. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Jamie Wells, who is an adjunct professor uh, here in Philadelphia, Drexel University School of Biomedical Engineering, Science, and Health Systems, uh, where she's been involved in helping to spearhead the nation's first degree program focused on pediatric engineering engineering, innovation, and medical advancement. Uh, Dr. Wells is an award-winning board-certified pediatrician, many years of experience in caring for patients, uh, did her bachelor's at Yale, her, her medical degree here at Jefferson in Philly, uh, and she has served as a clinical instructor, attending physician at NYU Langone, at Mount Sinai Beth Israel, and St. Vincent's Medical Center in Manhattan. Uh, Dr. Wells also currently serves as the director of the Research Science Institute at the Center for Excellence in Education, which is a nonprofit organization which is collaboratively sponsored by MIT uh, to bring together various top United States and international high school students for intensive six-week summer programs, uh, providing students with a wide range of opportunities to conduct all sorts of original research. Um, in addition to all that, uh, Dr. Wells is on the Leadership Council uh, down the street at the Worcester Institute, uh, which is the first uh, independent biomedical research facility and certified cancer center in the United States. Uh, she's ambassador uh, in healthcare, the Global Blockchain Business Council was a grant reviewer for the Susan G. Komen Community Grants Program. Uh, she has judged both the local district and world robotics competitions for Dean Kamen's uh, first nonprofit organization, as well as Miss America's Outstanding Teen Scholarship Competition. She's a member of the board of directors, and uh, she's also the chair of the Yale Alumni Health Network. Uh, and when she's not doing all that, she uh, spends a lot of time uh, in communications on various platforms, BBC, you can see her on Reuters, Fox News, Discovery Health, talking about a variety of medical topics with an expert. Uh, she's published over 400 articles uh, on a range of different topics, both medical and educational advocacy, um, has a wide range of interests that we're going to be getting into. Uh, but welcome, Dr. Jamie Wells, to our show. Thank you, Ira. I feel like I've done some things. <laughs> I need a nap. <laughs> Quite a few. Quite a few, actually. Made me tired. Just about. <laughs> but, um, you know, Jamie, I, I, I'd love to, to start off like we typically do, um, handing things over to you for a little bit, just to, to further talk about yourself, introduce yourself. You can sort of take us back to the beginning from everything of, of where you grew up, uh, how you got interested in medicine, how you got interested in pediatrics, and a little bit of that early journey. I think that's going to shape the, uh, the story of everything we're going to be talking about. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me on here. This is such a delight. I'm so beyond impressed with everything that you do. So this is a real treat for me to be here. I uh, really grew up with, I have to start when I was younger because my grandfather, who actually graduated from Drexel in the early 1900s, was born in 1894. And he was my world. He was a true Renaissance man. He and my grandmother lived with us growing up. We all participated in his home health care. He would paint a picture for me in one hand and simultaneously solve a calculus problem in the other hand. He could listen to any piece of music he never heard before and five minutes later play it on the piano. So we did, he taught me the Pythagorean theorem when I was four years old. I never nice. had the perspective with his, he graduated with a civil and architectural engineering background. And engineers, I've just, they've really shaped my worldview from that time because, and I grew up in a medical family, so it was, I excelled in math and science, so pursuing medicine and being a caregiver was kind of in my DNA, and I happened to also have a passion for it, but he really instilled in me a growth mindset and a way of looking at failure is just one other way not to do something. I just, he would approach things you know, I like to attribute uh, him being one of the earliest biomedical engineers. Um, that's my distinction for him, <laughs> my, because he developed intractable in intention tremors later in life. And an intention tremor is when you intend to do something that you shake. For an artist, mathematician, and the like, that can be devastating. And honestly, many of us, when we face challenges like that, you know, choose to you know, go one way or another with it. And so what he decided to do was, it was a natural thing for him to design these stabilizing contraptions for his upper extremities so he could still paint, still draw. It wouldn't even have been an option not to do, find some workaround or some kind of solution to this new onset problem. And he really achieved, if you look at his work pre and post tremor, he really achieved 
you know, 85 80, 85 percent. So you can see a distinction pre post tremor, but it didn't stop his joy. It didn't stop his zeal. He would say, thank God I'm alive to see another sunrise. And you have to do mental gymnastics every single day to keep your mind alert. So I grew up with a father who's in medicine, cousins, my um, my uncle. Uh, we cover all hosts of fields. <laughs> but I actually, when I was little, if you would see uh well, I'm a Jersey girl at heart, so I was born in the best state that there is, <laughs> which, you know, I, thankfully there's nobody on here really who can dispute that or, or argue it with me. Um, but I, you know, for me, the Philadelphia, New Jersey, Delaware, that's kind of the area none, you know, you go one, five minutes in one direction, you're in each of those places. Yeah. I um, was very fascinated with the brain at a very early age, and I really had a self- um, you know, my parents would try and encourage me to go out, but if I didn't do well enough on something, then I would, you know, not let myself go into it. I was very directed and very serious, the first, um, very serious driven in the first portion and love, had just such a love of learning. And I was extremely passionate about it, the brain and how little we had yet to know about it with how much we studied it. So given his intention tremors, and I had another grandfather with Alzheimer's, I, from a very young age, wanted to pursue neurosurgery. So if you ask anybody who knew me, in fact, do you remember that children's game show on Nickelodeon, Double Dare? Okay, sure, sure. So I'm a Double Dare champion. Nice. <laughs> so I want Double Dare. And if you look at, which is a children's game show on Nickelodeon, it's a trivia and, you know, I swam through a vat of cereal and milk, had nice. Sunday dunked on my head, you know, kind of thing, and actually went into syndication. So the funniest thing, thing was when family members when I was in my 20s were in Hawaii and saw the 12 year old me or whatever it was on TV competing on Double Dare. but you'll see the host ask me what do you want to be I'm like I'm going to be a brain surgeon so I actually when I uh I don't know that you necessarily think that through it kind of was what's the pinnacle of knowledge and and that kind of stood out for me and it was in line with my pursuits um, you know, I went to math science camp. I, it's a full circle moment for me as director of the Research Science Institute. I'm an alum of the Research Science Institute, okay. which um, now, as you stated, is collaboratively sponsored by the Center for Excellence in Education at MIT. And RSI is the flagship program of CEE, which is the Center for Excellence in Education, mm -hmm. and uh, which was founded by, co-founded by Admiral Rick Over, who is considered the father of the nuclear Navy. And um, Joanne De Janeiro, who is its current president, and it was intended to, you know, really in nurture, nurture kids, high achieving kids into STEM careers, uh, create international collaboration. So when I attended, I think it was 70 some from around the world. And it was, it moved to MIT a couple years a year or two after I attended. So when I went into DC, I was assigned a project for the summer on gene therapy and breast cancer research at Georgetown Lombardi Cancer Research Center. Another yeah. student's program was restructuring the flight pattern at Dulles International Airport. <laughs> Some, someone else had national security clearance and went to the Pentagon every day. So if someone else developed their own math theorem. And you know, when you talk about from an early experience, I had a very unique experience. Um, I was the only female in math team, captain math team. I competed in math and science. I was a unicorn at that time. So when I attended a program like RSI, it was I met some like-minded people. Yeah. When I transferred schools in fourth grade to uh, Penn Charter in Philadelphia, Penn Charter had been, which was my school that I attended from fourth to 12th grade, it had been an all-male school for almost 300 years and we were the lead class. So when I went in fourth grade, we had about six girls in the class, seventh through 12th all male, and we were the lead class. And when we ascended, it was maybe eight the next year, two years later, 10 or 12 in our year with all of high school still being all male. And one of my, this is kind of a theme in terms of my life of always being underestimated is when I at first, when I was in third grade in the New Jersey school system, I was be doing sixth grade math. Okay. And when I transferred to Penn Charter, they assured my parents that they would accommodate my math skills. But when I arrived, this was a different time. <laughs> as ageless as I am, this was a very long time ago. And they, um, when I arrived, they didn't believe a girl could really do that in math. And that kind of set the tone for my experience being a pioneer. So they insisted on having me independently tested, where I remember going to some independent facility where there were glass 
windows where people were watching me take tests after okay. test after test. And it came back that I was doing ninth grade level math. So nice. then it then it was, well, how can we put a fourth grade girl in an all male ninth grade math class? They thought that would be psychologically damaging. And so like everything, the there were a lot of good intentions and certain things were executed better than others as that experience. But I cultivated a resilience being the lead class of females in an all male school uh, who was academically competitive at the time and did, you know, I was the first female ever to do tennis. And, you know, I mean, there were just a lot of things in terms of that. So it, it certainly prepared me well for the world. <laughs> and, and um, you know, it was an incredible experience. Um, as I said, I've come full circle now directing RSI, but one of the other things at that time, which is another program actually that CE sponsors is I was supposed to in high school, I was selected to represent the United States in the biology Olympics okay. and go to, it was supposed to be held in Poprad, Slovakia, Czechoslovakia at the All time. Right. And I was part of a five man team to do five person team to do that. Uh, but the, there was political strife at the time and the trip was canceled. So that was my, um, my Olympic dreams were dashed mm. in terms of the biology Olympics. But I went on to pursue, uh, you know, I wrote, I always have had this creative and analytic side. So I was editorial editor of my paper in med school. Uh, I wound up going to Yale and was very set on pursuing a career in neurosurgery. I didn't want to waste my opportunity there exclusively majoring in a science because I felt that was my life, that was going to be my life's work. So I actually majored in American studies, which uh, with a concentration in media and film at Yale and simultaneously did all my pre-meds. And which was an incredible experience. And I loved uh, my time there. But I always felt that what was so important was to eliminate the silos. I feel like silos are the, and echo chambers are the yeah, yeah. greatest impedance to innovation. So uh, one of the things for the Yale Science and Engineering Association when I ran that undergrad was inviting speakers who were in health law, med policy, CEOs, and that kind of thing to cross those barriers. But I was very... Um, set when I started Jefferson for medical school that I was going into neurosurgery. And when I pursued it, um, I was told I was the only female in the Northeast applying at the time. So that again was an interesting experience. I matched in New York and I wound up moving to New York City uh, to start my neurosurgery residency, but I was displaced by 9-11 and mm. it kind of was real the realization that if this is what I want to pursue in my life, I have so many passions that for me, it just wasn't, it was the dream of the eight-year-old and not necessarily, there's nothing more fascinating. I got to assist in, in brain surgery cases and things like that, which is pretty amazing to say, but it's much more, it's much more meaningful to say that I did it. I pursued a dream, achieved sure. it. And if this is what I wanted to do, I was ready to do that. But I realized there are so many other things I wanted to do. And I wound up falling into pediatrics. I never, if you would have asked me, my, I never would have, uh, imagine that that would have been where I would have ended up. And I trained at a cystic fibrosis center in New York City. Mm -hmm. I got very involved with the Boomer Size and Cystic Fibrosis Foundation okay. and was a medical expert answering their medical questions online, volunteering for them for a number of years. And pediatrics really got me back to why I went into medicine in the first place. There's a purity and honesty with children. They tell it like it is. Geriatrics and pediatrics are my favorite. <laughs> so things in between, but I I could go on forever. So I don't want to. Um, I don't know where you want me to stop. No, it's a, it's. I, I'm just I'm fascinated listening to the journey so far. But I I I, I um I, I will take over at this point because I think um th there's a a wonderful transition here. Um uh, and, and 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 please don't any gaps that that we missed along the way. But um you know the this program, which, uh, you know, over here at Drexel University, which you were involved in creating in terms of oh. pediatric engineering. Um, and, and, you know, I, we, we are all familiar one way or another, whether it's a, um, a, you know, a patient package insert for a healthcare or a physician package insert of that sort of little area where, you know, it talks about drug facts and, you know, it says, hey, uh, not tested in pediatric populations and so forth. No. This goes for medical devices and everything else. Um, you know, these little people in this house, they have three of them myself. Uh, they're, they're not just smaller versions of me. Uh, they, uh, you know, different gene expression and biomechanics and, and, and mentally, of course, they're different. Um, but we never really think about 
doing stuff for them in sort of the, the engineering space. Uh, now you are, you know, you've created uh, this fascinating new program. Talk a little bit about sort of what pediatric engineering is and how uh, this program got put together at Drexel. Well, first I've, I've helped with it. Dr. Amy Throckmorton is a tenured professor in, in biomed who's really spearheaded this. Uh, there's a research arm, they're doing a lot of different levels to this, but I was uh, able to get involved with helping design the curriculum uh, for their, as you stated, Drexel Biomed uh, is spearheading the nation's first degree program in pediatric engineering. Uh, but I'm going to rewind for one second. So sure. I said that I, I, because it's just an interesting full circle, another full circle. No, I want to hear about it. Shows it's how you're, so it shows how your life can, I believe knowledge is cumulative. Mm -hmm. So I had this you start to put the pieces, you experience things through life, then you get a wisdom at a certain point where it coalesces. And I feel like I kind of, have, well, I know that I know a lot, I don't know a lot of things and I know the things that I do know, but it is such a joy and a gift, this realization with pediatric engineering. And I'll come back to that because in a million years, you know, I, I wound up falling into pediatrics. I started in practice in New York. I was there practicing, built up, seeing one patient a day, gave talks, gave, was affiliated with NYU and a couple other hospitals in New York City. Practiced for many, many years, had about 90% joy, 10% frustration, which is pretty great in medical practice. Sure. Uh, but that started to really shift towards the end where I felt there was an ever widening gap between policy and medical practice. And I, I felt it was compromising patient safety and decimating healthcare, honestly, people who are very well intended making decisions that impact patient care, but haven't necessarily cared for a patient. So I'm kind of one who puts a deadline on my own complaining. I have to, <laughs> and then I have to do something. So I wound up shifting out of practice, as you said, and it was kind of a renaissance for me because sometimes when you you know, I, my whole half of my first portion of life, I wanted to be a brain surgeon, brain surgeon, brain surgeon. And then when you pursue it, achieve it, leave it and real and move forward from it, you liberate yourself in a way you mm -hmm. have to do it because you can't have regret that you didn't like, I will never regret. I know that it wasn't the right thing for me ultimately, mm -hmm. but what it wound up doing was, you know, I, as I said, I had these two sides of my brain that were always, when you're in full-fledged medical practice, your creative side gets gets kind of like evaporated a little bit to a certain extent just because of what's encouraged or not in that in that realm and I got to discover like you said with regard to Dean Kamen and for those who don't know Dean Kamen um, so this was my first data point into adulthood of kind of being open up to the realization in the last decade ish that biomedical engineering is an actual field. Mm -hmm. You know, I was on this medical school track when I was applying to medical school and in medical school, biomedical engineering wasn't a thing necessarily in a formal sure. realm at the time. And I had come to a place of, I'm not going back to any, I'm not going back to school. I'm over, <laughs> I've kind of done, done enough. I'm into continued learning always, but I, right. I didn't feel like getting another degree at that point. And I got involved in first, which is Dean Kamen, is the inventor of the Segway, which most people know yep. that, that um, transport system. But he also did the portable at-home dialysis machine, the continuous infusion pump, which is uh, used as an insulin pump, cardiac stents, water purification system. I mean, he's really extraordinary. And I would argue that his nonprofit for inspiration and recognition of science and technology, or FIRST, would be his greatest achievement and invention because he's probably had over a half million kids worldwide participate in these robotics programs. It has increased girls and minorities going into STEM fields. Mm -hmm. um, so really your ability to change the world. And I would encounter, I remember when I was judging it and I'm encountering all these kids ex so excited about going to biomedical engineering. And it was the children who kind of introduced me to it as being a field. And then spending time with Dean, I was like, oh my gosh, I feel a kinship to that way of thinking. I mean, mm -hmm. he's on a level that, I mean, it, it, he his brain works. I need, <laughs> it's unbelievable. I mean, sure. he's just an extraordinary person. But I, I started to put out to the universe, gosh, there's so, there's so much lost innovation on the front lines of healthcare. I can't tell you how many people, nurses, doctors, everybody who just makes it work when they have to do something. I mean, when I would be in practice, like finding a, finding a tourniquet to draw blood was probably a rarity for years. You just have to make do and figure out how you, you know, can, it is what it is. You just do it. And so a lot of things aren't formally identified as innovative or innovations and they go nowhere because, uh, you know, there's such a, there's such a, 
there, you know, the, there's those who are the heart and soul of healthcare and frontline medical people who I just have the greatest admiration and respect for, and I've been one. In, <laughs> and um, and there's just a gap between their influence on a lot of the bigger things, their ability to get a voice at the table, a seat at the table, sure. which I, I personally think is unacceptable. And I don't think it's in the best interest of patient care. And so um, I kind of put into the universe, I'm like, oh, gosh, I really am inspired by this creative way to make things better, to help things, but I don't want to get an engineering degree. I got to hook up with an engineer okay. who, where, you know, a lot of times in the field of biomedical engineering, you have an engineer and a clinician, you know, who work together to think things through. So when Dr. Throckmorton asked me to get involved with pediatric engineering, that Drexel was spearheading it, it was like, how did this you like to think that you kind of did certain things to put yourself in an atmosphere, but I have to say it was unplanned, but it was a dream come true because I learned things from her. She learned things from me. It's everything I stand for in terms of tea, you have, in terms of advancing things forward. What you learn in your industry has incredible value and is a way of thinking in all of your professional experiences that I could probably apply and never get exposed to in the practice of medicine or um, in healthcare. So pediatric engineering, a lot of people, a lay person may, anybody who hears pediatric engineering, they probably think designer babies, sure. which is, it is not what pediatric right. engineering is. So what you have to consider in terms of biomedical engineering is think about every single thing a doctor, nurse, or any healthcare provider uses from therapy to medical device to anything to treat you, assess you, uh, from the syringe, there are physicists and other things in terms of, you know, calculating rates of flow mm -hmm. in terms of your IV, uh, cardiac pumps, yeah. um, surgical equipment, uh, drug delivery. How, there are physicists and biophysics and bioorganic mm -hmm. physics, bioorganic chemistry, um, really more bioorganic chemistry, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll have to correct myself later, but, and I'll call you later and say, oh, I made up a word. <laughs> like, That's like a cool word. I'll come up with, there is bi bioorganic chemistry is a word of maybe bio, I mean, there's physics to bioorganic chemistry actually, because they do deal with the atomic structures yeah. of how things are flowed. So, I mean, there's so much integration and collaboration. And I'm not into buzzwords for their for the sake of buzzwords. I'm into actual collaboration. I mean, mm -hmm. collaboration has been uniformly a buzzword for years, but there's but now I think people are really realizing the value of actually implementing collaboration and the interdisciplinary. I think most in, significant amounts of innovation are lost at the interdisciplinary knowledge gaps. And, you know, getting a fresh pair of eyes or seeing it from a different direction is crucial. So pediatric engineering has really come to fore because conventional thinking was, like you said, children are little adults and you just scale things. You know, you have something bigger, you make it smaller mm -hmm. for a kid. But that is actually very subpar for, and has been <laughs> recognized to be hi highly limiting. I mean, think about a premature infant who is whose heart is the size of a walnut and they yep. have a congenital heart defect. And then you have a 200 pound, six foot male, adult male mm -hmm. who has a sim, you know, and they both need cardiac pumps. Well, you can't take a cardiac pump. No. Number one, you have a premature infant whose skin integrity is more fragile. Their immunity is different. So children at multiple, st they grow, you know, once yes, you do. make, you may, you know, they grow on every level. So when you're talking about going from the neonatal to more infant, toddler, um, you have biopsychosocial needs, physiologic needs that are different. You have issues of autonomy and personal understanding and autonomy. You don't want to set a patient up to fail. Uh, think of them more commonly, not even just cardiac pumps. So someone who has a cardiac pump say, or, or needs some kind of cardiac device from, they need it to grow with them from pediatric, potentially from pediatric to early childhood to adolescence. So it might be four pumps by the, or four devices by the time they're uh, in adolescence. Or think just about the common thing you see in every movie or on the street, the asthma pump. Sure. Well, those aerosols aren't about getting in the mouth. They're about getting deep into the lungs, coordinating that effort is something that I could kind of instruct you to do, but has some flaws to how it, you know, will get at the maximum input, but try 
utilizing that for a toddler. You can't, there are attachment devices and things that, um, and then there's a nebulizing machine that you can use as an alternative. So in terms of medication administration, therapeutics, a lot of the cardiac surgeries they use for, in, for really tiny babies, they use the ophthalmologic equipment that is used to retract the eyelid for the baby. And so, um, but you, as I said, you have much thinner skin, you have, they're not designed, those re lid retractors and things are not designed to use for the pediatric heart. So you also have multiple caregivers. So medication error in the early portion of childhood is very real and, and shifts for its reasons throughout adolescence. Um, you know, adolescents will test limits. They um, will take more risks potentially, or uh, they'll get a little more autonomy in terms of taking their own medications than someone much smaller. So there are a lot of changes emotionally, psychologically, physically, anatomically, structurally. And I think we recognize that, um, or at least the world is waking up to recognizing that they're not little adults, that uh, you have to commandeer design to meet the patient where they are. And I've always said that you could come up with the greatest solution and invention to everything, but if it doesn't, you know, consider the end user or the person, yep. it'll sit on a shelf forever. So this is a very exciting time because, you know, in addition, in the past, um, as part of conventional wisdom was, you know, everybody says left and right how they care about children. They, oh, the children, the children. But, you know, our society is very based on, on defining what they value by what they put money into. And so the, the thinking has always been, or the, the party line has always kind of been, well, you're only having X number of patients with that disease, whereas you may have 30,000 in the adult population with this disease. So you know, it, was, it wouldn't make financial sense, right. but that's actually been shown that the market is growing globally in terms of pediatric engineering. And so um, it's very exciting and it's about time. You're seeing now, like you mentioned, with respect to how a, how a child is going to react. Their immune system is very different. Take, in fact, emerging infections. Yep. Some diseases that really impact adversely children, adults have a little cold from. Some that really, you know, ground a parent. Well, kids aren't even touched by it because yep. they have a different immunity. So extrapolate that to every organ system. Um, and it's just, it's more than size. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's fascinating all the the details that you know. Some of the, you have to has to think through, and in sense, creating these programs and, and and all the interdisciplinary <laughs> components to it. It really really fascinating stuff. Um, you mentioned um, Dr. Throckmorton a couple of times, and I, I was reading that she uh, is working on a uh, an art, a pediatric artificial heart. Once again, here you go. A, a heart <laughs> grows and changes. That's, and why, that's probably why I'm. <laughs> It's not so subtle that I'm I, right. I the cardiac cord a lot. But yes, I'm, I'm very fortunate that she brought me into this world there. I'll, and um, I believe we'll be teaching the courses together in the coming year. Uh, we just co-authored a paper in um, with cardiothoracic, cardiothoracic surgeon from Jefferson. Mm -hmm. from, um, it's a, a, a paper on the importance of this new applied science um, in the journal Artificial Organs. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's imminently coming out and very exciting and talking about why we need to train uh, future engineers and the like in a multitude of fashions. Yep. Um, because again, you can, you know, I've always recognized if you can't articulate what it is that your science, right. that you're passionate about pursuing, then you won't get the funding to pursue that or you won't reach the people who need to be reached. So you have to kind of have many hats to be able to not just have some phenomenal idea, which they have over there, but also an inability, as you said, to execute it. And they're doing a wonderful job at Biomed to um, incorporate a research arm and educational arm, which I've been fortunate to be a part of. And so it's, it's just very exciting to be a yeah. part of a you know, if, if I look back at the beginning of my career in a million years, I never would have found, but it makes total sense because yeah. I can utilize my industry experience from practicing medicine as many years as I did and also be a part of something that can leave a lasting legacy and help. Because um, as I said, knowledge is cumulative. It's never wasted. I think you need to pursue new challenges to keep your mind active and alert and having different points of view, I think only advances societal progress, especially when it comes to medical advancement. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um Jimmy, what, one other part of the program I, I found fascinating, and about a year ago, I had um, 
uh, Deborah Howery from the CDC on, on, a, on an episode. Um, and, you know, she's charged the whole area of uh, violence and injury. Um, and, and the numbers, just when, if, if you take out the injury component, of the numbers are staggering, not just deaths, but just the, the incapacitation, the car crashes and all sorts of other injury. We don't, I mean, the numbers skyrocket compared to cancer and, 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 and everything else. Um, this is another area we sort of don't think of it, that a pediatric biomechanics and crash injury. Uh, say, say, say a few things about what you're looking at with regard to that, because uh, the, the amount of deaths here, it's just so shocking. One of the things that was so wonderful about, um, because you're exactly right, there's injury, there's preventable injury. I mean, as I was talking about medication errors, just one arm of preventable injury. You know, you have multiple caregivers, they give the same medication. They don't realize the other person at 1 a.m. gave, the other parent gave the medication. Um, there is uh, a lot with respect to oncology and drug delivery. There is, so how we kind of designed the course is we divided the pediatric engineering one and two into kind of the first, the first course is divided into five main sections. So of course, with, of course, the cardiovascular <laughs> was included as one of those mm -hmm. oncology. Um, I think throughout we uh, did, we also included, um, you know, neurological impairment. So we had autism included in that and behave, and learning disabilities, as well as other forms of brain tumor and brain injury. Um, so we really kind of categorized it. And the thing about it is that because of the many different things that I've done, um, and recognize the importance of it. You know, pediatrics is, is like anything else, its own community. So I was able to bring in uh, subject matter experts from each discipline that we chose to focus on. And what the students did was, you know, they had to identify an unmet need in each of the sections, design a solution, do market analysis, how they would design it. Um, and then that grew and, and, and expanded to different layers in the, in the second course, but I was able to bring in the chair from NYU of pediatrics, who's a pediatric hematologist and oncologist who really focused a lot on what needs to be fixed in transfusion medicine and the limitations of platelet storage. Um, had someone, um, had my, my BFF, Dr. Paul Offit, uh, who I think you're aware of, who yep. is the co-inventor of rotavirus of vaccine. Uh, he came and talked about infectious disease and vaccine development. Uh, as well as the COVID stuff, because it aligned with when <laughs> that was starting to happen. Yep. Uh, so we, I also um, brought in from Columbia, the head of maternal, uh, she does, she's a cardiologist who uh, all of her patients, in addition to transplant cardiology, she also focuses on uh, pregnancy related uh, cardiac disease. So we really took it from the perinatal through to adolescence. Um, we had in injury uh, researchers come from uh, different places. I had someone from who heads the Center of Immunobiology who talked all about the immune issues in terms of IVIG and um, other kind of storage and the expense of those drugs and how to get them to kids, as well as uh, the different respiratory conditions and the treatments for those and what needs to be advanced in that. So we really covered a lot of different fields. And by, expand, by bringing in, um, I also had the head of minimally invasive pediatric surgery come, who is head of that for, um, who's at Hackensack as well as NYU. So really got from different areas, um, had uh, E. Andrews Kolb who came from, he's the director of uh, childhood cancer research at Nemours, DuPont. So mm -hmm. really brought in for each aspect of these main umbrella um, issues that, really need kind of new sets of eyes and people focused on the problems. Um, and so I guess when you ask me what mine is, mine is, you know, my life's work is about, uh, I, I mean, I'm inspired by kids. I think they're extraordinary. It's a pri It was a privilege to practice pediatrics. You're really a part, I call it the grand humbler. You're a part of people and their families' lives. I don't care if it's a CEO in their child, a, an artist in their child, whoever mm. it is in their child, becoming a parent is the grand equalizer. Um, I've seen toddlers and chairmen of the board negotiate and the toddler wins. <laughs> <laughs> every single time and so it's really your part it's such an incredible it's it's children's first exposure to healthcare. Mm -hmm. so i love everything about the field of pediatrics and it's so much more you know 
I believe in an old world style of medicine. When I practiced in New York and was building this practice, I 100% had my email and cell phone. I did home visits when I could. We know that continuity of care improves patient outcomes and anything less than that is just not, again, acceptable to me. And, and medicine has become so fragmented that, um, you know, any effort to kind of streamline that or make better or improve or to eliminate unnecessary suffering, you can't always change the course of an ominous diagnosis, but you can at least try to eliminate unnecessary suffering. Mm -hmm. So I'm very much a part of anything that really empowers people to be advocates in their care, whether they're pediatric or any field. Uh, this has particularly been on the pediatric bent, but you're talking about sometimes acquired illnesses, sometimes congenital illnesses. So you want them to get a head start going into adulthood, as opposed to, you know, adolescence is a time when it comes for chronic disease, where, as I said, teenagers test their limits. So when they have chronic disease, a lot of times it can go real wild because they won't necessarily comply. They don't want to be different than their peers. So there are all of these different times um, that diseases change and morph and you want to be able to facilitate their success. So any aspect of that, whether that's, you know, being an emotional support, being a medical support, trying to come up with a design solution or help those who can, um, then that to me is, making an impact and and I always at least am motivated by trying to make something better than how I found it mm -hmm. but I find all of the fields fascinating injury prevention is hugely important to me because a lot of things are preventable yep. and suffering there's suffering in this world and if something <laughs> suffering can be prevented that would be <laughs> incredible um but yes I I'm kind of, they're all enormously gratifying to be a part of the different um, components. Neuro obviously is particularly interesting to me and always will be. So mm -hmm. I'm always um, going to be keen to listen on advances in that because a lot of brain tumors and things haven't necessarily shifted, you know, sure. with, you know, glioblastomas, things like that haven't changed in their care or in terms of their prognosis in many years. So there's always improvement. And um, I don't think there's an illness or, a, or a, a, I like to be, if I can, the nexus and conduit to putting people together who can make it um, happen in their particular subspecialty or field. So there's a lot, there's a lot of material to work with oh, yeah. between preventing disease or vaccine or, you know, other kinds of therapeutics and treatments. Absolutely. Jamie, take us uh, now into the world of, of Research Science Institute, because you, you as you said at the beginning, you, you started out in the program, now you're running the program. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I've I've met, not, not in this program, but a, another organization that I once interviewed, uh, it was a 13-year-old that was just starting her own biotech company. Um, and I say to myself, if we have a thousand of these kids, we don't have any problems in the world anymore. They basically solve everything in a couple of years and we're done. That's, um, that's, what my, that's my entire point is that, you know, so I wrote my paper at Yale, you had to write a senior essay, your senior year. Mine was on Ebola. You could have substituted any other emerging infection or anything. Okay. And my basic hypothesis was when there's a common economic concern, the media machine, public health machine, and, and political machines will work in harmony to make things happen. And if you go back through the history of, of, or at least modern history of how infectious disease, emerging infections are going to be an issue with humanity till the end of time. This is not the last pandemic. No. You know, we know this, but our pattern is unchanged. We throw money and resources at it. We're reactive at the time that it happens. Then once it's quelched, the money goes away right. and the scientists are screaming, no, it can't because we can, you know, and then the same cycle happens again where we're playing from behind. Yeah. So one of the biggest things that I realize is investing in the next generation, like actually doing it, not saying you're, you know, it's great or something like that, because these, I mean, to speak specifically, the program that I'm directing, uh, Research Science Institute, as you stated, which is collaboratively sponsored by MIT and the Center for Excellence in Education is, is typically held at MIT, but it will be virtual this year due to everything. Sure. Um, but it's the premier uh, STEM program in the world. Uh, so we have this year, 83 students will be coming. Um, the program has, rep has been in existence since 1983. Well, the center, uh, so it's been in existence for a while. One of the best things about it that really eliminates barriers is that it is cost free. So if you can get yourself into the program, um, it really does uh, 
eliminate for we have diamonds in the rough from rural areas to set to urban you know people who no matter what your resources no matter what your anything if you are the best at what you do or you create I mean some of these kids what they've been able to create in their environment you know no matter where they are in the world is extraordinary so um we have some who are attending who've already filed patents we have some who are co-authors in published journals or have been first author in major journals they're 15 or 16 you know um so they come for the summer the first week is notable alums of this program include include ben silverman who's the co-founder of pinterest um, Fang Zhang, who was very instrumental in developing CRISPR technologies, mm -hmm. Lauren Ansel Myers, she was just on the BBC talking about herd immunity. She runs the COVID-19 uh, modeling consortium. She does mathematical modeling for COVID. Um, you have uh, Terence Tao is an alum. He won the Fields Medal in math, which is equivalent to kind of the Nobel Prize in math. I think he attended RSI when he was around 12, but I can't be sure on that. <laughs> so typically it's the summer after junior year before senior year. And as I said, it's normally about 80 students. This year it's, it's about 52 US students. The rest are from the global community from Saudi Arabia to um, China, Singapore, Columbia, you know, you name it. And these are the top students in STEM. They are extremely motivated. One of the most overarching attributes that I've seen is the humility. They are doing, they're, they're very civically engaged. They're finding unmet needs in their communities and solving them, creating foundations, creating a whole host of other things. So they're not one track minded in that pursuit. Mm -hmm. They come, they get intensive instruction in the first week, which typically includes Nobel Prize winners. Uh, then they are assigned, each of them has, they indicate their primary and secondary fields of interest and they're matched. So I've matched them with uh, mentors in their particular space. And that includes, um, we're gonna have, pro we're having students this summer who will be doing uh, projects at MIT's astrophysics uh, Cavalli Center uh, that's working on a NASA mission. So someone's mm -hmm. gonna be working on that. We have students who are interested in biochemistry, physics. They, the lion's share will be doing their research. They do novel research. They do research this summer. Uh, they learn how to go through the entire research cycle. We culminate in a symposium. Um, the best thing about the symposium, they'll, they'll choose the top five for the uh, oral and written presentation. So they'll mm -hmm. go through the entire process of writing the paper. And this is a very condensed, intense period of time. We have tutors from around the world. We have an academic staff that participates who are incredible. One of our tutors is, uh, I mean, has been doing, is very seasoned and has um, the hu humanitarian, the humanity math um, for Head in Hungary, we have another who is um, just graduated. We have all ages and ranges of experience and they're all seasoned and she's gonna be pursuing her PhD at Harvard. So all of the, the lion's share of the projects and their mentor matches are at MIT, Harvard, because the program typically is there, but we've had the benefit this year of virtual. For example, um, one of the students' particular interest is immunobiology and innate immunity. Well, the person in the world to do that is at Yale, where I went to school, so match that person at Yale. Um, we have another there. Uh, another in neuroengineering that's going to be doing a match with Drexel, actually, I made for the Drexel Solutions Institute. So we're having them, they'll culminate in these projects. And then many of them, for example, one of the students from last summer, one of them last, it was either last month or in the last two months, the Regeneron first place prize, $250,000 for her research project. Another student from last summer first authored an article that came out uh, within the last few weeks in health affairs, which is the premier, you know, health mm -hmm. policy journal. This is like a 16 year, you know, a senior in high school now. So they're all making incredible advances yep. and really being actively engaged. And even more than that, they learn professionalism. They are learning skills of diplomacy. They're meeting kids from all over the world. So we have, we have talent shows, International Day. They learn things about every one of their communities. In all of the years in terms of RSI, there have been um, all of, you know, 56 nations represented. Uh, the alumni, I can say that the program leaders uh, at the Center for Excellence in Education have been in my life since I attended. Uh, two of the, the women who I went to RSI with, um, one of them I was in her wedding and I was both their pediatrician when they were in New York City and we're still very um, much in touch. One of them um, is the has written a book on pediatric neuroradiology. She went to MIT and did neuro. The other one, you know, when she was at Harvard did 
some conference for all of Asia that she ran <laughs> like these. <laughs> They're all in very different, not everyone goes necessarily into research, but some are leaders in STEM fields like biotech, as you described, and the like, but it all is intended to increase collaboration with future colleagues globally, as well as nurture the US STEM talent and um, encourage and open people's eyes. You know, it's very rare to be able to get universities and health systems and things to have high school students sure. in the labs to do research for obvious reasons but these students are really um they're so gracious they're really motivated to change the world and me and when and when i i know that i went on it uh, over here but coming back to the main point is that maybe some of them in this bunch are going to come up with something that prevents the pandemic from even happening as yeah. opposed to even having to develop a vaccine or something else because their ideas are extraordinary. When you read, I mean, their applications are 25, 27 pages long, their ideas, their way of already structuring how to implement upon those ideas. Um, it's just really inspiring. It's optimistic in a year that was kind of blah for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> just totally, I highly encourage people to go to CEE.org. Um, all of the programs at the, C at the Center for Excellence in Education are cost-free. They do teacher and STEM enrichment programs for teachers who can go to, back to their schools that, aren't, that don't have the resources to do it otherwise. And they really, you know, can expose young minds to something everyone can be successful at that makes you really a, contribute, a positively contributing member of society. I can't, I, I like to say STEM with two M's with medicine at the okay. end because I don't think I don't think you can really anymore separate the two there's mm -hmm. physics in medicine you know think about the pregnant um woman it's the most extraordinary designed human system it's the suspension system better than any man-made suspension system that, that you is true. and then there are circuits and sir and the perinatal circulation so I mean there's a lot of stem in the practice of medicine and and it's further to to you know, progress. So I think this is the most exciting. I think to be proactive so that we don't have as disruptive a uh, pandemic, um, really investing in our next generation is something that um, shouldn't have to be said, but is, I, I want to bang it uh, with an exclamation point, is so important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, at that age, they don't have <laughs> all the hindrances of everything you experience out there uh, in the silos and, uh, well, that's, and sort of that, that's so to your point it's the, it's my biggest thing is that once you get on your trajectory you know things are changing thankfully like med school a lot of people know they want to go into um, you know finance stuff but they want to get a medical degree or they know they want to go into kind of biomedical engineering mm -hmm. your your ability to do that is easier now because it's not you know when I went to medical school it was like you go to medical school you practice medicine and I was this it was very much you know when I was contemplating shifting out of medical practice it was well what are you going to do well what are you going to do like you're a doctor what are you going to do and I just have never had that, my mindset is kind of, as my favorite expression Dean Kamen says is when people tell him something's impossible, he knows that it's a definite maybe. <laughs> or if people tell him he's crazy, it's a definite maybe. But you know, when, I, when you know that there are other avenues that may be more right for you or um, are necessary for your continued growth and learning and, and such, it, you can stay in something longer than you, um, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not so advanced to hearing, well, I guess what, you know, if you're in a, if you're in a la less confident phase or a vulnerable phase and you're, you know that you need to make a change and don't know what to do and everybody's saying, well, what are you going to do? It can have an impact on you at least, or at least taking longer to come to that conclusion. And the reality is, is I just think I've never been of that mindset, you know, unless like, yes, if you want to be a brain surgeon, you have to be specifically trained to be a brain surgeon. But mm -hmm. I, I think that this pigeonholing of people and putting on them, you know, what your fear, which as you spoke to, that's the beauty and luxury of when you're young. And I think, I don't know if it was physics or math, but I remember reading something where the greatest discoveries are by age 27 or something. Cause we do, we all acquire more fears as we get older and, and you, I mean, in certain ways, good, but in certain ways they can, it's, it's when you exceed the balance of making it prohibitive from, um, you know, that's the, that's the point of life is to 
try something new. Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't, you know, and I, I just came to the place for me, like if I can be a doctor, can I be anything else or other things or something like that? And I can still do that in so many capacities. So I think it makes you a better doctor and better, you know, I took a stand-up comedy class between the time that I resigned from my neurosurgery residency and was deciding what to do next. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I just said, do something you're afraid to do. So I took a stand-up comedy class and, you know, and I joined co-ed football in Central Park and basically doing everything other than thinking about what I want to do. It slowly made me realize what direction I wanted to go to. So I think there, you can always make a career transition. You can always go back to different things. You have to really look at like what the risk is. And I, I've been in medicine, healthcare from a personal and, pro and professional um, from my personal and professional experiences to realize that end of life people regret the things they didn't do mm -hmm. and not the things that they, you know, did. So I'm, tr I'm trying to <laughs> try to live that way, but I don't always succeed. No, it's uh, you, you're succeeding in a lot of things. It's, it's, it's extremely <laughs> impressive. Um, let's, um, let's go in a slightly different direction now, actually, actually related to what we we're just talking about. And um, I'll set the stage on this one. Um, so I'm sitting here in downtown Philadelphia and I can point in, in any direction here. And we're, I, I sit at the epicenter of, of sort of vaccine history. Um, yes. uh, Stan Plotkin uh, with, at Ru Rubel at Worcester, uh, who was on the previous show. Len Hayfleck, Michael Plasma at Worcester. Uh, Barry Blumberg, Fox Chase, Hepatitis B, Nobel Prize, he used to live across the street. Uh, and I did meet Hillary, Hillary Kaprowski at Jefferson when he was doing his rabies work. Sorry, I'm, I'm, we're leaving out Sabin and Salk, but you and I could take a drive and go visit where their stomping grounds were. Um, and, and you mentioned Paul Offit, who lives around the corner as my well. My BFF, he'll tell you that he's my BFF. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, you know, it's the epicenter of it all. You and I are right nearby it. Um, and one of the things that you focus on, aside from all this other stuff, is debunking of myths medical myths, vaccine myths. Uh, watched you on an episode debunking vaccine myths with Paul Offit. You did a couple of years ago. It's 2021, Jamie. Um, how have we gotten to this situation uh, with all this vaccine resistance and insanity that is floating around right now? And take that one and run with it in any direction you want to go. Well, you know, I think that the media does us no favors. And, you know, as someone who believes that the media be can be utilized for good instead of evil, and that's what I attempt to do, I think the 24-hour news cycle has done a great disservice to good information and quality information. Um, I don't think pro and anti and polarization and labels and uh, I'm never into social humiliation or mockery as a, I think it's a coercive technique. You have to understand fundamentally, I took an oath to do no harm to even whether I'm practicing or not practicing anymore to, you know, do what's in the best interest of the patient. And for example, you know, when I was practicing in New York, vaccine hesitancy is, uh, is always going to be a thing like a lot of other things, you know, you'd be amazed at, at what people are, are worried about. People's fears are different, but fear is the same. And when people have children, they have a weight of worry that they've never had before. Um, you know, I remember when I started in practice, I thought, oh, my older parent, you know, I just, it wasn't any really thought, well thought out thought. I just kind of was like, oh, my older parents, I mean, you're, they'll be more, um, they've lived longer, you have to have ups and downs in life. So maybe they'll have a better perspective or anything. But sometimes the longer, the, the more you're around, the more you're, um, you know, it's a very tricky thing when people have kids and their life changes in a lot of ways and, and they may shift what they're doing. They may have been a CEO in something and now they're not. So they misapply that. You know, you can't, Parenting is very different than CEOing or whatever, and the, and the same things sometimes how you approach things don't apply or very bright people have nuggets of information and, and you know, it depends on what your core is of how you want to, um, you can feed that beast to make it think what you, you know, you want, or you mm -hmm. can decide, it depends on your point of view. But I always had an issue ethically with those who I, I, I understood it because the amount of conversations surrounding vaccines in a busy practice 
it absorbs so much time and it's so disproportionate because when you're seeing patients in pediatrics, as an example, you're assessing their cardiac status, their developmental status. And a lot of times what was happening is that the vaccine discussion was consuming and hijacking every single visit and multiply that by how many patients that you have to see. It, it, you're, the things that are actually happening don't get the same attention that as something, all these what ifs and that kind of thing. So I always found, I understood why certain practices came to a point of refusing to see patients who refused to vaccinate. And I never felt that that ethically was something that I, um, number one, I think you lose an audience. And then that audience coalesces with others who are like-minded and they become an echo chamber and, and it's not out of ill intent necessarily. It's just, you know, it's all fear-based and people have fear about a lot of things in healthcare and we don't kick them out of a practice because they don't stop smoking or they don't stop. It's not a paternalistic kind of thing. It's, it's my role I always saw as giving the best information to facilitate the best choice that empowers their autonomy. And you know what I found is that the people who are fearful of vaccines and hesitant of vaccines, they're not a monolith. When you have a conversation for five minutes, there's a very different reason where certain things come from. And there's always some other thing that you address and deal with. And I found that, you know, having that relationship of a person that they trust, ultimately everybody got vaccinated pretty much. But uh, they would comment, I would be like, let's start with one. I guess in place of one, they come to one, they're reality tested and see that nothing happened, come back in a month and it's all ready, just give them all, give them all, let's go. They're on to the next, you know, it's a shifting of worry. So I think it's unfair and disrespectful to treat everybody like there, there are people who are about, give me every single surgery, every aggressive thing in the world. I want a cure. I want to live. I don't care what you do to me. You can remove every part of my body and do it. And there are other people who choose not to live that way. Okay. Um, so finding that balance, there are a lot of things that people do with uh, that impact other people adversely beyond vaccines. So this special status with regard to vaccines, I think is also part of a problem because there's so many factors where people's decisions adversely impact others around them as well. But if you can ha treat people with respect, I find that if you can come from an empathetic lens, understand their come from and what their particular fear is. Some people it's just, they have friends who are more, um, read everything and they just, you know, they're told that this is what you should do. And then you actually, give the good information. Um, unfortunately, having a one-on-one -on -one one -on -one conversation with every single person is a challenge to do, but I think it's worthwhile. And I, I just don't, I, I've learned in medicine beyond vaccines, making people do things that they don't want to do. Like the goal is to not coerce, right. to, you know, show respect for people's, you know, decision and things. And have an actual conversation, answer the questions, and everybody is different. Some people need more information to quell their anxiety. Some people need less. Some people, you know, and I think that becomes the art of medicine. But I, I do think that ad hominem attacking people's lazy man's argument and solves nothing. I've never changed a heart and mind by yelling at someone that they're ignorant or stupid. I don't believe people are, you know, I just don't sure. function that way. But I do think that's one of the problem. And then these bandwagons where people are so fearful, what happens is when you're so fearful to even express what your concern or worry is, mm. it's okay for somebody to, I would be concerned if someone, if something is new, if something's whatever, you should be an informed patient. What treatment do you want to give? What, whatever. I find the information out. Great. I now know that this is what I want to do. So I think having like free flowing, good communication, that's non-judgmental and, you know, um, in theory, because I don't, I don't know why you would apply that not to vaccine hesitancy, but do something different for mm -hmm. surgical, you know, denial is very powerful and people mm -hmm. make not great decisions about when, you know, waiting too long to see the doctor or waiting to, because these are very real things. Fears can really, and I'm not, I, I mean, I certainly am the worst patient ever, but <laughs> But I, but I, but I, I just, I don't know. I think we've lost some humanity in a lot of the public discourse and um, it's okay for people to have fears about different things. And I think actually allowing for that would, would convert more people to realizing that the risks are way lower than the benefits with regard to vaccinating. And that apply and, and, you know, in my, I've given, gosh, how many over 13, like, a, you know, in New York, tons and tons of vaccinations. Mm -hmm. So this isn't a new conversation. It's different, 
Right. But it's, you know, it's, there's always going to be batches. And, and also, you know, pre COVID when, when these vaccine, these vaccine conversations, people didn't have the luxury of remembering a time when people had issues with polio and, and these other mm -hmm. things. So they're a gift and, and I'm grateful they exist and I advocate for them. And, you know, I got my, <laughs> I got my vaccine. So, um, but I, I do, I, I do think it starts with that. And I think that people, when you like treat them with respect and explain the things and, and debunk the things that are, cause you know, things that go around the internet, I, I mean, can go around the globe now in four minutes. Yep. And, you know, people aren't even, um, I remember when I started in uh, my educational advocacy work, doing a video for like four minutes. And then by the time I was in my last year of doing that, people weren't watching a video beyond a minute and a half. And then, you know, a lot of times I even find myself not necessarily reading a whole article and seeing the headline. So if your base, you know, clickbait headlines can be very misinforming in terms of, of information. So, yes. So I'm sure I'm in the, I'm kind of like, treat people like people. And I think you'll get a better result in terms of compliance with vaccines. Thank you for that message. All right. <laughs> uh, Jamie, uh, as we've been talking, you know, you, you've, you've mentioned folks like uh, Dr. Amy Throckmorton, uh, Dean Kamen, I see Paul Offit. Um, take a little time, if you would, just uh, obviously you've met a, a range of interesting people in industry and in academia, government. Um, take some time, um, important other important influencers, mentors uh, throughout your career, um, people you're working with now, uh, you want to shout out to uh, take the floor on, on this one and, and anywhere you want to go. Uh, well, actually, I have a great fortune of next month, June 10th, I'll send you the link. I'll be interviewing for my alumni health network uh, ambassador, Nancy Brinker, who's pretty cool. extraordinary. Absolutely. And she's now, uh, she's the founder of Susan G. Komen. Mm -hmm. She won the Presidential Medal of um, Freedom. She, uh, by uh, President Obama. She also was appointed by Bush. So bipartisan, you know, mm -hmm. I'm very apolitical and I'm about what's the issue and how do we solve that issue? The rest to me is noise half the time that impedes <laughs> progress. Uh, she's now doing, uh, she's been a go goodwill ambassador for uh, the World Health Organization is now working in the Promise Fund of Florida to get with, to improve health inequities um, in breast and cervical cancer. So I'm very excited to speak to her. And she's always been a very big, big big support. Um, there, like you said, there have been very, uh, you know, my experience in neurosurgery wasn't um, universally positive at that time. <laughs> so there were definitely some. Um, so, you know, there, Dr. Sean Grady at Penn was very supportive at that time, which was a rare time for people to be supportive in mm. neurosurgery with females. Um, Dr. Paul Offit, as I described, has been a wonderful resource. I remember Dean Kamen, for example. I knew him for like 10 years, and the great luxury of knowing him for a very long time. And when I was going back and forth about, I needed to make a shift. I um, saw things changing in healthcare. I wanted to do something about it, but I didn't necessarily know what, I was working 24 seven for weeks and weeks on end. And I didn't know what to do about it. And I actually went to, it's funny because I actually remember speaking to my childhood pediatrician who started a company at 60 in his broom closet. He was wow. a successful pediatrician. He started a company at 60, grew it to thousands, sold it, did another company, sold it. And I remember meeting with him saying, I, you know, I don't know what I want to do, but I know I need to, you know, make a shift. And he said to me, one of the greatest pieces of his advice, he said, Jamie, stop meeting with doctors. And, it, and I think that applies to whatever field, like if you're a business person, stop meeting with business people or stop meeting with, because you do, I have all these wonderful networks because I've done a lot of different things, as you stated, in all different industries, academia, medicine, um, you know, every, every aspect, every socioeconomic strata. I have just have a beautiful, you know, their quality. I've had a great fortune of encountering so many quality people who lead by example, who I could only aspire to be. And, or to, you know, get some of their skills. And I remember when you said that, it kind of was like, I, I was doing, I was in my comfort zone. I was, what did I know how to do? Find a job in clinical practice. So I was like meeting with so many different hospitals, health systems, and 
And every single time I'd be like, oh, but I know this isn't the right thing for me. This isn't the right thing for me. And I was doing the same thing because that's what you know to do. You know how to find a job in clinical practice and whatever. And so I met with, with, as I said, my childhood pediatrician. And when he said that, it spurred in me, wait a minute. I know Dean. I've never had a conversation like this about it with him. So I, I sent Dean an email and I said, you know, I've decided I want to shift out of practice, but I don't know what to do. I'm kind of at a crossroads of what I, which direction I want to go. And he's like, he had me up to New Hampshire within a week and a half. And we spent six hours, him talking to me about, and I just, and the way he views the world is so, so I feel, and then that started a domino effect for me to realize that I should start having these conversations with different. And I, I just saw so differently because some, you're just surviving when you're in that mode of getting in a little bit in a rut, you're kind of surviving, doing what you know to do and doing it well. But, you know, um, I think, you know, it's so important constantly to reassess what, reassess status quo. We all have a tendency. I used to believe I was such a decisive person. And I was, you know, two years in my mind of knowing that I needed to do something, but just didn't know what it wanted to do. And I still two years later was in the same spot. And I realized like, I don't think this is who you are to be in the same. I mean, sometimes it's a process Mm -hmm. and change really is a process and you have to be willing to sacrifice, which a lot of people aren't, you know, whether that's financially, whether that's downsizing or doing things to make a true change. But I mean, I think it's truly worth it. And I think career transitions can happen at any point. I don't think there's a limitation in that, but I think you need to really understand that you could be sacrificing in different ways, in totally different ways. Like, but you know, for a couple years in terms of changing your lifestyle or changing things. But I can tell you when I made that choice to leave medical practice, I wound up um, realizing my father was being misdiagnosed, got him properly diagnosed with an abdominal cancer. He wound up, you know, he wouldn't be here had I not made the choice that I had to then be in the position and then was actually in the room with him when, and he'll freely speak about it. Um, it that, That also was a pivotal point is that one of my dearest friends in the world was admitted to Sloan Kettering for a different cancer when my father was admitted for a major surgery and they, and my friend passed away and he was, um, it was a complicated course and and ultimately did very well. And he's done, you know, done great, but had three totally different cancers taking him home from the hospital. But I was in the room uh, with him and had to call a code on (laughs) on him and if I wasn't there he wouldn't he wouldn't be here so like my perspective is I'm so grateful because I had conversations with my dear friend that I never would have been able to have had I not made the decision that I had so like what you have to realize in life is where you think that you're sacrificing in one area things that you never dreamed of happening that change the course of your entire life that are even more incredible can wind up happening and I think also and I think everybody should practice medicine at some point because I do think it keeps you a little bit um I would say that was a particularly stressful time taking him home from the hospital we got hit by a Mack truck so mm-hmm. like there were and thankfully everybody was okay but it was <laughs> It was, it was a lot. And I had to take, you have to take your boards every decade. And I had my boards to take something like by December 16th or something. And I think I took them the day before the deadline because it was kind of like, it is what it is. I, you know, I had so much crazy going on. And so I took them, I think like the day or so before the deadline to the point that I think I was probably the only one in the country because I got my results like a couple days later because I think nobody else, like everybody else took them sooner or something like that and did fine. But I just think that life happens. I kind of, I try and I'm not, it's okay to be bummed one day that you don't have things or you look at things that you have or don't have. Sure. But I do try to realize like it is short. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. Um, I think that there is a point of the process of going in your mind because some things happen in that, in that two years, I joke that like, I wasn't anywhere in two years, but you have to get yourself. It's a process to make changes in, in whatever you do, whatever aspect it is. And Mm -hmm. I, I have, it's always been important. You know, the folks at CEE, Joanne DeGenero and Maite Ballestero who work at CEE, they've been there since I was, since I attended when I was in high school and They've been very active. I always attended alumni events in New York and elsewhere. They've always stayed in touch and made sure that, um, you know, if there were anything I was interested in pursuing, they would always be a help if I needed. So I have really encountered extraordinary people. I have um, throughout my family has been incredible and supportive and friends. And um, 
you know, I'm grateful for all those opportunities because they bring you to the next. And I think your mindset of that is extremely important. Um, I like to say I'm a skeptical optimist. I can't be, you know, I, I always try and see the bright side because um, I'd much latter, rather live in that. <laughs> I'd much lever, rather live in that world. But you're going to have to convince me why yeah. you're not just going to be spoon fed certain things. And that's important too, because, sure. you know, you have to use critical thought. So I've had um, at each phase some great folks. And I've dealt with, you know, as I said, being the first female in a lot of environments, you know, mm -hmm. you saw a lot of behaviors you'd never ever dream of emulating and you saw behaviors that you could only dream of emulating. And the one thing that I always encourage the young folks to do is when you encounter someone who you think is quality and you value or look up to them in any way, stay in touch with those people. The people that are quality, the people that you admire and respect. And um, it's really, I, 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 the thing about life that's enjoyable is that I will continue to meet people that, I have zero doubt that I will continue to meet people that inspire me and um, keep me motivated to, to doing different things and, oh, and expose me to things I never knew existed. And I, that's the, excite, the most exciting part. All great messages. All really great messages. And you, Ira, now you're, you're, you're up there as my new MVP. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I can inspire somebody. That <laughs> It's 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 been a really great time, Jamie. And this is um, your messages, your uh, your your various programs, both for the new generation, uh, both for the pediatric engineering. Uh, I mean, you're pushing so much stuff forward, and it's really uh, exactly the type of uh, a person that we like to profile here on this show. Um, for Everybody that's going to be listening to this particular episode on uh, the YouTube, uh, listening on the podcast, watching on the YouTube channel, uh, you've been listening to uh, the, the true energizer buddy, Dr. Jamie Wells, uh, adjunct professor, Drexel University School of Biomedical Engineering Science and Health Systems, director of the Research Science Institute, Center for Excellence Education. Uh, I encourage you to, after the show, to Google her uh, and uh, on other forums because she's involved in so much. Uh, really great stuff, Jamie. I, I just want to, you know, again, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to, to talk us through this amazing story. Thank you for everything you've been doing. And as, as we like to say on our show, Thank you for helping to create uh, a better tomorrow for everybody from what you're doing. It, it really very inspiring. You know, that, that is so sweet. I hope it was meaningful and I'm really grateful. And I always am interested in learning about all opportunities. So people should certainly uh, reach out to me. LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever the other ones are and stuff like that. So I always welcome learning about constant learning and um, I love making new connections. So feel free to reach out. And I um, am so grateful that you've included me today and think that I have something worthwhile to contribute to. I'm appreciative. Absolutely. Thanks so much for your time, DJ.